Thank you so much. For and we'll, we'll probably have time just for a few more, but yeah, please sure. go ahead. Thank you so much for your important work and your talk, uh, Dr. Mate. My name is Hoon Jung Kim. My question is if you could uh, share more about healthy anger and potentially share some specific examples sure. on how we can express anger in a more healthy way. Got it. Do you mind participating in an experiment with me right now? Sure. About He's going to get you anger. angry. All right. Okay, All right. okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll try. <laughs> okay, great. How do you feel about the distance between you and I right now? If, if I gave the rest of my talk from up here, is that okay with you? Uh, it's okay. It's not ideal, but it's this... No, but is it okay with you? That you stood there and I stood here. Is that okay? Uh, I'm fine with it. Okay, you're fine with it. Great, yeah. Now, how would you feel about it now if I stood one inch from your face and did the rest of my talk from there? How would you feel about that? Would that yeah, be... That, that would be too close. That'd be the, yeah, okay. What would you... No. In this experiment, where you're standing is your life, so you can't leave it, Okay. This is your life. You can do whatever you need to do, but you can't leave it. Okay? So I'm standing one inch from your face. You don't like it. What would you like to do about it? If I can't leave where I am, I guess I would... You can't leave. Then I would try and have you move away from How me. would you try to do that? Uh, I would first ask you to move. Okay. And, and I say, very nice. I don't care what you ask. Okay? <laughs> now what? Uh, I, I would not want to push you. You'd push you. <laughs> okay. okay, very good. As you're pushing me, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Um, fear and anger. Both. Anger. Yeah. That's healthy anger. Okay? Healthy anger is simply a boundary defense. It says, you're in my space, get out. That way we don't have to fight. Because if I heed your anger, I'm going to step away. Okay? So all the anger is just about... That's why your brain is wired for anger. Okay? Now, that's healthy anger. In general, the role of the emotions is to allow in... Like somebody else in your life, maybe a partner or a spouse or a child, you might want to look up even closer. You might want to hug them close, right? So the role of emotions in general is to invite in what is healthy and welcome and nurturing and to keep out what is unwanted and hostile, right? You got that? Trick question. What's the role of the immune system? Hmm. It's exactly the same thing. To allow in what is healthy, you know, healthy bacteria, nutrients, vitamins, so on. Keep out what is unhealthy. The news is, they're all one system. When you're suppressing the one, you're suppressing the other. That's why people get autoimmune disease and a lot of malignancies. Now, that's healthy. Anger is a boundary defense. It's like an emotional immune system. Keep out. Unhealthy anger. Then there's the repression of anger, where it's so deep you can't even generate it. That's what leads to all kinds of stress and illness. But then there's unhealthy anger, which is not based on boundary defense in the present moment, but some, but some hurt being triggered from the past. And then... Healthy anger, once you express it and it's done its job of protecting your boundaries, is over when it's done its job. It's gone. You don't have to keep raging about something. It's done its job. Unhealthy rage, which, by the way, is also a risk factor for heart disease and strokes and high blood pressure. Unhealthy rage keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing, regardless of the stimulus. So that's the distinction between healthy anger and unhealthy anger. Fair enough? Yeah, that's very clarifying. Um, it's a way to think of it, sort of a real-time boundary defense, is kind of expressing your anger and letting that out in a healthy way. Yeah. Okay, okay. thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank we you. just have time for one more, so, so sorry we can't get to everybody, but we have time for one more. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mate. My name is Heather, and I'm from Minnesota. Um, I'm really interested in applying your ideas at a systems level. Um, On what? Healthcare in this country is in crisis, and there are many reasons for that, but in my viewpoint, something that's not talked about so often is because the healthcare system itself is trauma-organized, and also because many of the human aspects of healing, the relational aspects of healing, have sort of been pushed into the corners of the room. And so I'm curious, um, if you were to take a systems lens, how would you approach healing a trauma-organized healthcare system? So let me tell you a few things. Um, somebody once said, how do you organize a cult? How do you create a cult? <laughs> well, you um, give them a special jargon and a uniform. You sleep, <laughs> you sleep defied them. You separate them from their families <laughs> and you put them under authority and leaders. In other words, you send them to medical school. Okay? <laughs> medical school is very traumatizing for a lot of people. That's the first fact that I'll tell you. The second fact that I'll tell you, there is something called, actually, Elisa Apple, who's a dear friend, and I don't know if she's here tonight, but she's speaking at the conference in the next day or two. And Elisa has done a lot of work on telomeres. And telomeres are, she'll talk about it much more articulately, but they're, they're structures at the end of chromosomes that keep the chromosomes together. And that the longer that they are, the healthier the chromosome. And as we get older, they, they fray, they get the chromosomes, you know, the telomeres fray, and so do we, you know. And, and, but stress also shortens the telomeres. They looked at the telomeres of medical residents and other people the same age, and in one year, the medical residents, they lost a lot more length in the telomere than other people their age. So we're talking about a highly stressed profession. Number three, some studies have indicated that the highest level of empathy and compassion that medical students have is right before their training. So you've got kind of a system, you could say it's designed that way, but it's not that it's consciously designed that way. Systems kind of design themselves. They kind of this system generates itself to generate profit and to generate power. That's the essence of it. If you want a system that generates power and profit, you're, going to treat, you're not going to train medical students in trauma because this, you know, if you come to me with depression and I say, hey, you got a problem with lack of serotonin in your brain, and I'm going to give you Prozac, which will elevate your serotonin level. That takes me two minutes. 20 milligrams a day, come back in a month. But if I had to talk to you about why you depressed your emotions in the first place, in your family of origin, I'm going to just spend time with you. Not very profitable. Even if I had the insight. So what you're asking me is, how do you create sanity inside a system that is designed for power and profit? Well, this is a political question, it's not a medical question, it's not a health question. And some people are making beautiful um, initiatives here and there, create community-based health care, uh, patient-empowered health care, um, multidisciplinary health care, um, but as a system as a whole, the people that have and wield the power and who garner the profits, and they're the ones who have the ears of the, well, not the ears, the pocketbooks of politicians, the same thing, you know, politicians hear through their pocketbooks, and they're in charge. That's what has to be challenged. Okay?